Uh, it is good to see all of you here. And uh, as you can see, we've got uh, live video going. Uh, we're going to record this to, uh, to Zoom uh, and uh, uh, make it available to, um, to the rest of the community at another time. Uh, I do appreciate all of you making it here this morning. And before we get started, we know we're a little bit behind time, but we want to make sure that we actually uh, do justice uh, to our conversation this morning. Um, we've got uh, two fantastic guests who've come, and I don't want to waste a whole bunch of time um, with, uh, with introductions and uh, other things that we might want to say, other than to say that it's important that our community uh, begin that conversation or continue the conversation about what law enforcement looks and feels like in Stanford. Uh, some 53 years ago, uh, the Stanford uh, city leaders thought it a wise thing to create a police commission, which has worked quite effectively and uh, in a joyful way for the city uh, as far as promoting law enforcement and our officers. Um, we need to take a look at what the next 53 years might look like. Something has happened with the police accountability uh, law that was passed. We want to be able to investigate it from looking at the facts and uh, determining um, what does Stanford look like as we go forward. So we decided that we wanted to have these series of three um, programs one to just specifically talk objectively about the law itself uh, and to know what the facts were or are. Uh, a second session to talk about uh, what we've learned from different communities, including Stanford and the work that's being done here. Uh, and then thirdly, that with that information and other information that we'll be sending out to folks, that we would use that to have um, some community dialogue with officials, uh, with faith leaders, uh, with everyday people in the, within the streets, and uh, and with the business community uh, as to what this should look and feel like for the future. Maybe we're just uh, very comfortable with what we have. Maybe we tweak something, or maybe we leave everything alone. But it's a conversation, and we want to make sure that we have an opportunity for people within the community to join in that conversation. So with that, uh, there are a couple of people here I do want to acknowledge. The chief uh, is here today, and I thank you for, for coming, uh, uh, Chief Shaw. I know it's very busy uh, at this point in the year for all of us with families and gatherings and what have you. Ted, I'm appreciative of you being here. You're a great service to the city of Stanford, uh, but you decided to leave us. So we're going to convince you today to need to stay just a little bit longer. Um, Ken Barone is here uh, from uh, the Institute of Municipal Regional Policy at UConn and Hartford. Uh, Judge uh, Devlin is here. He is the Inspector General for the City of Connecticut. Uh, but we also have uh, uh, several luminaries here from the City of Stanford as well. And, and one of them uh, is uh, Judge Mary Summer. She's here. I'd like her to say a few words about the work that we've been doing, and then we're going to move right into the rest of our program. Uh, the uh, leader of the 100 Black Men uh, is here as well, Josiah Lindsay, and we're going to ask him to say a few words. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and I will really only take a very brief amount of time because I, like the rest of you, am very interested in hearing from both Ken and Judge Devlin about the really important work they're doing to um, implement the um, aspects of the Police Accountability Act that Connecticut was really on the forefront in enacting and the problems that communities face and police face in um, making our community safe and building that trust within the community and having the police have the resources that they need to serve the community. Um, it's really a, a part of where this conversation is, you know, going to give us a platform today from these, um, both uh, Ken and Judge Devlin, who are deeply immersed in it. But here in Stanford, we're also very fortunate that when the George Floyd tragedy occurred, a group of people came together through some leadership, particularly with Cradle to Career, who facilitated a number of us in having a conversation 
that resulted in us issuing a call to action. It wasn't enough to sit aside and look at the tragedy played over and over again, but to look within our community. And so um, a number of, as Michael said, faith-based leaders, community leaders, as well as along with the police leadership in the town, had a number of conversations that occurred over the course of that um, year, year plus following um, George Floyd. The, uh, the result was a call to action where communities came together and many of you were involved in those organizations that began and are continuing to do work with ample leadership, um, particularly the library, um, but many, many others um, along the way. And this is, again, another, a very big step in the uh, community commitment to becoming more educated to see how we can work together for a stronger, safer community. Um, the uh, <clears throat> particular uh, aspect of the call to action in addition to the community commitment to eliminate systemic racism in our organizations was, in fact, the commitment to work with the police. Following the um, six pillars of 21st century policing that were established under President Obama, which this police department, I can, as a Stanford resident, I'm proud that our department um, has established those procedures, is building its leadership um, and service on those principles. But there is so, so much more that we can do, and we're going to hear more about that this morning. Thank you. Um, here representing the Hydro Black Men of Stanford, we're a community organization. We like working with the police chief of Silas. We're, we're trying to foster development of the Stanford community. And one of the things that this act, uh, I think, brings about is a mechanism to help the community feel as if they have a voice and a real impact in how the police uh, interact with us. And so we're really excited about supporting this event. We want to be here for all three sessions and uh, tell your friends so that next time we have double, triple, quadruple the number of people in the room. I know this is streamed and people will be able to watch it uh, later, but I think having as much interaction in person is beneficial to cross-pollinate ideas and get a lot of energy going. So without further ado, I yield the floor. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name again is Ken Barone. I'm the Associate Director of a policy institute here in the state of Connecticut called the Institute for Municipal and Regional Policy. It's a mouthful at uh, the University of Connecticut. Uh, and for the better part of a decade now, we've been working on a variety of policing related issues. Uh, in particular, for uh, over 10 years now, I've managed the state of Connecticut's racial profiling law, uh, more recently managing our state of Connecticut's uh, use of force data collection law, uh, helped to staff and provide research support for the Police Transparency and Accountability Task Force, which we'll talk about a little bit today, and have generally just tried to do a lot of uh, work and research uh, for the state of Connecticut on all things uh, police related. Uh, so today I was asked to spend maybe 20 or 25 minutes um, uh, sharing with you uh, what was in the police accountability bill that passed two years ago and some of the efforts that the state has undertaken uh, in that time to continue to improve police transparency and accountability here in Connecticut. This is supposed to sort of serve as a foundation for your future conversations uh, to build from. Uh, to ensure that we're all operating from uh, the same set of facts and a, a good understanding of, of what Connecticut has done over the last two years in the wake of the murder of George Floyd uh, to look at and improve policing here in Connecticut. And there's a lot that's happened. And I certainly, uh, to try and cover all that in 25 minutes will be challenging. So I'm gonna try and do the 30,000 foot level and after uh, Judge Devlin talks about the very important role of the Inspector General and the work he's doing, uh, we'll then be able to take some questions from you and can certainly dig in more um, uh, in more detail to any of these uh, particular areas. So some quick background. The uh, bill referred to as the Police Accountability Bill is one large bill uh, made up of 44 different sections covering 28 different areas of law. So when we think of this one bill, we're really talking about uh, many different laws that were impacted by this one bill. 
Uh, the bill was passed and signed into law uh, two, almost two years ago, July of 2020, and the legislature has made some technical changes to that law in uh, both of the sessions that followed the passage of the bill um, as they as they work through understanding the impacts uh, of different sections of the bill. I'm going to jump right into the different sort of summary of the different sections of the bill. And again, <clears throat> the goal is to just ensure that we all have a good grasp of what was actually passed two years ago. Sometimes when legislation is being crafted and contemplated and debated in the legislative process, there are many different versions of the bill that will be presented before the final version is finally um, passed and ultimately signed by the governor. There can be sometimes a lot of misinformation that comes as a result of, of that process. And so, uh, again, the goal today is to walk through what actually passed um, versus maybe what we heard had passed or things that were being contemplated during the uh, legislative process that ultimately, uh, through that process, uh, either did or didn't come to fruition. One of the big changes in the uh, police accountability bill was dealing with police officer certification and decertification. This might seem like a small change, but for the first time, the state police, which is one of our largest, it is our largest police agency here in the state of Connecticut, is required to be post certified. Post, for those who are unfamiliar, is the Police Officer Standards and Training Council. They are the entity within the state that oversees all police certification. In order to be a police officer with police powers in the state of Connecticut, you need to be post certified. Post needs to say that you meet the requirements in the state of Connecticut to be a police officer. State police always had their own system, and so believe it or not, it seems small, but fairly big change to fold the state police so that all police in the Connecticut are operating under the same certification and accreditation system. The post council can now require officers to take a drug test as a condition to renew their certification. So that was new under the uh, legislation. And uh, it expanded, the bill expanded the reasons that the post council could cancel or revoke uh, a, an individual police officer certification. Uh, in particular, they added a category that included conduct undermining police confidence in law enforcement or excessive or unjustified force. So, uh, they expanded some of the areas with which police can lose their certification. Again, um, uh, excessive or unjustified force is a reason now for a revocation of, of certification. Under the original uh, post guidelines, you know, sort of summarize it essentially required a felony conviction uh, was, was typically the standard for losing uh, certification under the previous bill. Um, so this expands that a bit. It also allows the post council to suspend certification um, under certain circumstances and asks the council to develop clear guidelines for suspending, canceling, or revoking a certification from an officer. So they gave the post council some time uh, and said, okay, you know, you need to really work out all the fine details of when is it appropriate to suspend, under what circumstances, when is it appropriate to cancel, when is it appropriate to revoke a certification, and what's the process for doing that. I'm going to, um, the next section of the bill dealt with behavioral health assessments for police officers. Uh, police officers must now receive a behavioral health, health assessment at least every five years while on the job. So it required um, a behavioral health assessment to be conducted by a, a qualified psychological evaluator um, uh, in order to uh, maintain your certification here in the state of Connecticut. And it also built in some provisions to ensure that officers who may be uh, dealing with a challenging time um, or some sort of trauma uh, can get the help that they need and be supported by uh, the department uh, and the state while they seek, uh, seek that help. Uh, the bill uh, created a crowd management policy. It said that the post council needs to create a uniform policy with which police departments need to follow when dealing with large crowds, protests, uh, and other uh, events that might uh, require uh, police to interact or deal with uh, large crowd control. So 
prior to, to this model policy post needing to create, departments would have their own policies around crowd management. And, and most of the time when the state mandates a model policy to be created, it says to local police departments, you have to at least meet the minimum standards outlined in that policy, but you can certainly exceed those standards um, uh, and be more strict with those standards if you so choose. They mandated implicit bias training for all police, both in the hiring, uh, th uh, the initial uh, training process, and also in the recertification process. So police officers are recertified in this state, I believe every three years, they have to go through training every three years, so many credit hours, uh, and part of that requirement now built into it is the need to uh, participate in and maintain implicit bias training. Uh, it changed some of the collective bargaining and disclosure of disciplinary matters uh, or alleged misconduct. And in particular, it specifies that a freedom of information provisions will prevail over contrary provisions in collective bargaining agreements. This was a controversial one. It was really primarily targeting state police, right? They had some provisions in their most uh, recent collective bargaining agreement that um, we, we, switched, we switched the display, sorry. And got it. Excuse me. And, uh, where's the slideshow button? I must stop sharing for a sec. Is this the one we're sharing? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Question is, how do I move this? Can I just click that? Yeah, move that. Ah, there we go. Sorry, folks. Now we're getting there. Okay. Um, so it dealt with, um, right, there were some provisions in the state police collective bargaining contract that said that certain um, uh, certain uh, disciplinary matters uh, and misconduct files couldn't be uh, FOI and the legislature uh, made changes to that. <clears throat> Mandated that police departments uh, report on the efforts that they are making to try to uh, recruit, retain, and promote minority police officers, both racial and ethnic minority police officers and uh, female police officers. So uh, there's, not a, there's not necessarily a mandate of, of the number of minority or female police officers that need to be hired, but it was saying to departments, you have to have a plan and you have to tell us what your plan is to try and uh, increase outreach efforts to those communities. Expanded the Police Transparency and Accountability Task Force in 2019, the legislature created a police transparency and accountability task force made up of 10 members, uh, six law enforcement individuals, four police chiefs, two retired police sergeants, uh, and then um, four uh, other individuals um, representing different groups. Uh, and they had a very narrow mission at the time to work on two very small issues. And in the wake of, of, of the uh, murder of George Floyd, uh, they expanded the mission and added 12 additional priorities for the task force to focus on. A, another fairly significant change was uh, they also completely remade the post council, the police officer standard training council, again, which has a lot of say over police accreditation, certification, and general police standards here in the state of Connecticut. And in particular, they reduced the governor's appointments from 17 members down to 11. And they, um, they allowed certain legislators to now uh, have a say over who would be appointed to serve a term on the post council. Uh, and they also added additional stakeholders. So they bought onto the council some, uh, for example, uh, justice impacted people are now represented on the post council. A uh, member from the uh, disability rights community is now represented on the post council. So they tried to uh, broaden the stakeholders that are at the table, helping to set guidelines and standards for uh, police here in Connecticut. And they also, again, uh, broadened who would have appointing authority to ensure that there would be 
uh, more variety in uh, people weighing in on the makeup of that very important council. <clears throat> Seems small, but believe it or not, police were not mandated to um, uh, have a badge or a name tag identification. Most did already, but this just ensured that uh, police uh, clearly have their name identified and their badge number identified on their uniform. Uh, so right, people could very clearly know who the officer was. Civilian review boards. It um, allowed towns to establish a civilian review board by ordinance, and it also gave towns uh, uh, who created the civilian review board uh, subpoena power to be able to uh, subpoena um, um, certain records or certain statements um, during their investigative process if they created an investigative civilian review board. Uh, that was somewhat controversial only because uh, our state's attorneys and I believe our inspector general don't have subpoena power, right? Right. If something okay, limited, but you know, believe it or not, civilian review boards I think have more, which is interesting. Um, they asked the state to conduct a study on the feasibility and impact of social workers responding to certain police uh, calls, right? So, um, uh, required every police department to evaluate whether they thought it was feasible to have social workers if they're already using. So, for example, Willimantic has already uh, for years has had social workers integrated into the department and so talk about their experience there. Many departments have already utilized uh, crisis intervention teams that utilize uh, other non-police services to help uh, respond to certain situations. So the state said, we want to know from police, you know, do you think this is feasible? What would the impact be? Help us understand from your perspective um, if, if there might be a way to uh, have other entities responding to certain police calls. And so the state uh, received those reports. Um, they had about six or eight months to put those together. Body cameras, the bill dealt with body cameras, dashboard cameras, and it provided other grants to police departments to help pay for this type of equipment. Uh, in particular, it expanded uh, the requirement to use body cameras for all police in Connecticut. So it laid out a timeline by which uh, police uh, uh, throughout the state of Connecticut needed to purchase and begin mandating officers to wear body cameras. It also required that all police vehicles have dashboard cameras uh, installed in them, and it authorized bonding to help pay for some of the equipment. It doesn't pay for all of it, but the state was uh, uh, tried to pay for some of it. Uh, the bill limited law enforcement's uh, ability to utilize consent searches, particularly in a motor vehicle stop. Consent search, right, is asking um, somebody, for example, a motorist, if they can search their vehicle receiving permission, and then they search the vehicle. So it placed limits uh, on uh, uh, police being able to ask to, for example, search vehicles. Uh, uh, we're about the fourth state that did that. Rhode Island did it about six years ago, uh, and our language largely modeled uh, theirs. There was a prohibition on asking for non-driving identification or documentation of drivers um, for say uh, passengers, for example, in a vehicle. It prohibits asking uh, for non-driving ID for stops solely for a motor vehicle violation, right? Uh, Pre-docket prosecutorial review of criminal charges. By the way, you can see as we're going through this, right, just the breadth uh, within policing and the criminal justice system that this bill touched. Right. Now we're getting into um, role that prosecutors play. It required the chief state's attorney who um, oversees the division of criminal justice and the 13 uh, plus state's attorneys and the chief court administrator to prepare a plan to have prosecutors review charges before a case is docketed. The docketed meaning it's physically right placed on the docket calendar. And so it's saying um, right, it, it's an opportunity for potentially a prosecutor to intervene and decide that maybe a case isn't appropriate to be docketed and uh, potentially could be dismissed. Um, <clears throat> penalties for false reporting or misusing the 911 system based on bigotry or bias, bias. added penalties for people, right, falsely calling 911. Um, um, and, and it turns out that that call may have been motivated by bigotry or bias, for example. This was 
sort of the case, I think, right, was motivated by the case, I believe, that came out in New York, right, the woman who, I think, was in the park had called, um, um, and I think she ended up, I don't remember, I think she might have been arrested, I can't recall at this time, but that's sort of how that, that was motivated by it. Uh, it modified uh, use of deadly force and chokeholds. Um, it placed limit, it limited the circumstances under which an officer could use deadly force, um, is justified and established factors to consider when evaluating the officer's actions. I'm gonna sort of leave this to Judge Devlin, uh, but this is his area of expertise, uh, and I think he'll be able to talk in more detail about um, what the new limits have been placed on officers uh, and the new way of evaluating deadly use of force incidents. They also placed a limit on an officer's use of a chokehold or other restraint to the neck area. They created an, a duty to intervene. So police officers witnessing another police officer doing something that uh, they shouldn't be doing. They have a duty now to intervene. They also have a duty to report the use of unreasonable, excessive, or illegal force. Uh, so it requires police and corrections officers to intervene when a fellow officer uses unreasonable, excessive, or illegal force. They now have a legal obligation to, to intervene. Uh, it changed the use of force record keeping and reporting. This is something I've been working on. So starting on July 1st, next Friday, uh, every police department in the state of Connecticut will be uh, completing the same use of force reporting form. We had about 50 different versions prior to this. Uh, and they will be submitting those use of force reporting forms to the state. So we're only the second state in the country that will have a universal use of force data collection system so that we can generally have a better understanding of how and when police use force here in Connecticut. The first state was New Jersey, and we uh, largely modeled our program after what New Jersey has been doing for a few years. It made some changes to security service, security officer qualifications. It prohibits decertified police officers from uh, acquiring a security service license or performing certain security work. So, you know, if you were decertified as a police officer for a reason, for some reason, you can't then go and become a security officer uh, here in the state of Connecticut. It created the Office of the Inspector General. That's uh, really new here in Connecticut. We, prior to that, did not have an Office of the Inspector General. It not only established the office, but it also uh, moved Prior to the establishment of the Office of the Inspector General, uh, certain uh, uh, police uh, cases, particularly deadly use of force incidents, would be investigated by different states' attorneys around the state, depending on um, uh, they were assigned to somebody who wasn't in the area where it occurred. So now all of that is uh, centralized, it's conducted by the Office of the Inspector General. And again, I think he's going to talk about his office, the role that they're playing uh, here in Connecticut. Uh, chief medical examiner uh, must now investigate uh, all deaths that occur in police custody. So any death that occurs in police custody must now be investigated uh, uh, by the medical, chief medical examiner and also any death in DOC custody. That wasn't always the, uh, the case. So some of this just seems common sense, right? That, uh, but it was put into statute. Uh, prohibit Prohibit prohibition on pedestrian citation quotas, right? Uh, we already had a prohibition on quotas for motor vehicle stops here in Connecticut for many years. They just sort of codified pedestrian quotas uh, in the law. Uh, it limited police's ability to acquire military equipment, uh, typically through what they call the 1033 program. That was federal government getting rid of, right, MRAPs and other large um, other large pieces of military equipment. It, it limited uh, local law enforcement's ability to obtain and utilize uh, that equipment without the appropriate additional um, uh, the appropriate additional uh, approvals. This next one got um, probably the most attention in the passage of the bill. It's essentially the provision of the bill that deals with what we refer to as qualified immunity. Uh, it did create, the bill created a civil cause of action against police officers who deprive individuals of certain rights in state court. So individuals always had a right for a civil cause of action in federal court. You often see lawsuits brought against police departments or police officers in federal court. Created a civil course of action in state court 
and it established that the civil cause of action against a police officer who deprived an individual or class of individuals of the equal protection or privileges or immunities of state law. Right. So if you violate somebody's uh, basic rights outlined in state law, you don't have the ability to file a cause of action in uh, in state court. You only have one year from the time. Uh, 12 months from the time of the incident to file um, an action in state court, which is different than the standard for federal law, which I believe is three years. Um, so Connecticut's law is a little bit, uh, is a little bit stricter. We're going to come back on the next slide. There's a little bit more they dealt with uh, liability uh, for, for officers. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, law enforcement accreditation. It's uh, the law stated that beginning in 2025, all police departments in the state of Connecticut need to obtain uh, national accreditation through CALEA. CALEA is the National Accreditation Agency for Police Departments across the state of Connecticut. However, just this past year, the state modified this provision of the bill and so it's all departments uh, don't need to obtain CALEA accreditation, but they do need to they do need to obtain state accreditation. The state has a fairly robust accreditation program that they've put together in the last number of years and police departments are now uh, by 2025 required to receive state accreditation. One of the reasons for moving away from CALEA accreditation is CALEA actually came back to the state and said no, no we don't want anybody mandated ever to, to join our program. It's a voluntary program that only works if it's a voluntary program and departments willingly want to come to the table and participate in that program. Uh, we have about 25 of our 94 uh, 25 of our 107 police departments in the state are nationally accredited through CALEA. Most are not. Um, it requires money, time, resources. There's a lot that goes into both obtaining and maintaining CALEA accreditation. Um, uh, but we've certainly in the last five or six years, uh, five or six years ago, we had maybe half as many departments nationally accredited. So we're at least trending in the right direction. And uh, most of the state accreditation standards the highest, we have multiple tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Uh, a cross comparison of the state accreditation program at the highest level and the CALEA accreditation program are pretty close. So having departments get state accreditation um, uh, is, a, is a good step forward uh, and will largely line up uh, pretty well with most of the CALEA accreditation standards. We did, that just happened, uh, by the way, that changed this session. Um, we talked about uh, the uh, task force uh, membership. It, it um, uh, created a task force, again, comprised of 13 members, 10 voting, three non-voting. The voting members included four police chiefs, two retired police sergeants, um, a justice impacted person, a representative of the disability community, a state representative, and a pastor. And then the three non-voting members of the state task force, uh, the chief state's attorney, uh, the undersecretary who works for the governor of criminal justice policy and planning, and the desk, which is the state police commissioner uh, here in Connecticut. So I, before I get into just, I'm going to go real briefly about what the task force worked on. I just want to end, I want to come back to this civil cause of action, this uh, whole idea of, of qualified immunity. Because again, I think this is where there was a lot of uh, initially right, different versions of the bill had different language that dealt with this idea of qualified immunity. Um, at the end of the day, we provided an assessment to the Yukon Insurance Law Center. We were asked by the legislature to figure out if there was going to be a significant impact to the liability of officers or the liability of municipalities based on changes under the law. Um, and so we interviewed most of the major insurance carriers here in Connecticut that provide liability insurance to municipal police departments. And what we ultimately concluded is that uh, there will be little to no change in um, um, costs to municipalities uh, for their liability insurance based on uh, changes in the law. Individual officers are no more liable today than they were under the old law individually. Individual officers, uh, unless a court finds that their action is malicious, willful and wanted, which is a, a specific legal standard, uh, the individual officers, uh, municip the municipality that the officer works for must continue to provide liability coverage to the officer. So 
The officers are covered by their employer, being the municipality. The only time the municipality can drop coverage from the officer is after a court has found that the officer's actions were malicious, willful, and wanted, uh, which was the same standard. The municipalities always had the ability to drop liability insurance uh, from uh, individual officers if a court found that their actions were malicious, willful, and wanted. That standard uh, really didn't change. Um, officers, I've heard from uh, many officers in conversations I've had about you know, the need for officers to go out potentially and secure uh, their own independent liability insurance coverage. I continue to tell officers I wouldn't do that. There's no policy out there that will cover you for malicious, willful, and wanton actions. There's no, uh, I've had officers tell me they took out a rider policy on their home. They're not going to cover you if a court finds your actions were malicious, willful, and wanton. It's not a private policy out there. At this point, we assess all the private policies. Colorado is the only one that's, um, uh, they are requiring officers under certain, certain circumstances could be liable for up to $25,000 of, of a civil case. Uh, Connecticut doesn't do that, but uh, even, in, even in that case, we're really not seeing any policies that would cover uh, the cases by which a municipality would drop that officer. And based on our assessment of, of insurance companies who provide liability insurance to police departments across Connecticut, they said they do not anticipate um, very many, if any, uh, increases in uh, payouts as a result of, of civil cases. So uh, there was, again, there was just a lot of of rhetoric, a lot of noise around, you know, police officers losing, say, qualified immunity. Again, police officers are still covered by their municipality until after a court finds, uh, which was always the standard that, that didn't change, that their actions were malicious, willful, and wanted, which is, a, again, a very high standard. So um, as I always tell police, don't rush out, don't go buying liability insurance. Your municipality uh, is still required by law to cover you. Um, and uh, there isn't a policy out there that would cover you uh, at this point once the municipality drops the coverage. Because again, the municipality uh, is legally obligated to cover you until that point. Um, so it, it mostly what the law did was it opened up an action against municipalities and state court. It, people will still continue to have the right to file an action in, in federal court for civil rights violation, for example. That didn't change. The state can't do anything about federal law. Uh, it opened up an action in a very limited way in state court. It only gives individuals 12 months to file that action. Um, and even in that case, the municipality must defend the action on behalf of the officer uh, until and unless a court uh, deems that the officer's actions, again, were malicious, willful, and wanted, which was the same standard that existed uh, uh, if, if sued in, say, uh, federal court, um, the municipality was, was required to uh, provide coverage, uh, liability insurance coverage, unless a federal court also found their actions to be malicious, willful, and wanted, then the municipality could go after the officer to claw back some of their expenses. And that's been the law for a very long time here in Connecticut. Um, just real quickly, so that just some work, the task force continued the work on police transparency and accountability after this bill passed. So it's not like the bill passed and everybody moved on. This task force met multiple times a month uh, for the better part of 18 months. Uh, the makeup of it, again, we went through 13 members. They broke their work up into three working groups to try and continue to come up with recommendations to improve uh, policing here in Connecticut. The full task force met 27 times and the subcommittees met over 65 times over two years. So a lot of work went into the product. They hosted 14 public listening sessions, both for the general public and actually specifically targeted for youth. Uh, they held, I think, four youth listening sessions. Uh, they partnered with the Bar Association, a lot of really smart lawyers here in the state of Connecticut uh, that created a policing task force to help provide practical suggestions. Uh, and they also partnered with uh, the Post Council, the Insurance Law Center, uh, other offices, the Office of the Attorney General, police unions, and other subject matter experts. At the end of the day, the task force just this past January released an additional 21 detailed recommendations for the state of Connecticut's consideration. 11 of the recommendations went to the legislature for additional legislative action. 
11 of the recommendations run to the post council for administrative actions, things that can be done administratively, and nine recommendations were developed for municipalities to consider, things that municipalities could do uh, on their own. They also provided three detailed reports required by law, one which assessed the whole liability insurance issue, uh, which was and qualified immunity, one that dealt with uh, recovering bail fugitives, and one that dealt with uh, no knock warrants. The state already modified uh, after the bill um, how no knock warrants can be conducted. Um, <clears throat> real briefly, um, the, the task force worked on helping, uh, asking the legislature to deal with diversification goals, how police departments can further diversify. Um, uh, mandating that the state send out some best practices. Departments really struggle with what the best practices are to diversify. And so the, the task force said, listen, you really need to be helping provide some guidance to local departments so that they can meet their diversification goals. It recommended that the post council create a DEI unit within post, some unit dedicated to working on diversity, equity, and inclusion standards for police. Um, it uh, made a recommendation to municipalities that uh, they explore how to diversify their civilian staff within departments. Departments aren't just sworn officers. You have a variety of civilian staff, and so they really need to be considering uh, how to diversify. Uh, a recommendation to allow licensed clinical social workers to conduct behavioral health assessments, not just psychologists. Um, there's going to be a big demand on the state uh, every five years, right? To, uh, provide these assessments to officers and we need a bigger pool of people who can conduct them. Uh, mandated training uh, for uh, interactions with members of the disability community. A number of recommendations on how to improve police, uh, uh, pre-police contacts. So these recommendations were to the legislature to really deal with what are systems in place that can potentially divert certain police calls, right? Utilizing the 211 and the 988 system um, here in Connecticut, uh, we really need to do more work in understanding what types of calls can be diverted. The legislature this session did pass a mandate at our institute, provide a study to them by next year, uh, sampling 911 calls from a variety of departments to determine what can reasonably be diverted to other systems like 211, like crisis management, like suicide hotlines, et cetera. Uh, other improvements, again, to police contact. Um, these recommendations were all for municipalities. Municipalities should uh, develop, if they're not already, uh, CIT crisis intervention teams. Uh, they should hire or think about hiring social workers to be embedded in crisis intervention teams. Uh, municipalities um, should share data on uh, the use of licensed clinical social workers or MSWs. And uh, municipalities should pursue pilot programs. So, well, no, most municipalities aren't going to just go out tomorrow and hire 30 licensed clinical social workers. Uh, there really is no model across the country yet for sort of the best system or best approach. So right now what we're encouraging municipalities to do is to experiment. So Haven is doing one experiment on integrating uh, certain crisis intervention teams here in Connecticut. Hartford is doing another one. We've got Willimantic doing one in Connecticut. So we're really just encouraging municipalities think outside the box, do some small pilot programs, bring in the researchers to help study it, and eventually we'll come to a model that hopefully other municipalities can follow. <clears throat> and, uh, again, uh, other recommendations, um, municipalities should create an opt-in fully voluntary registry, registry system for individuals with disabilities. I can't tell you how many times we had parents come to these listening sessions, uh, predominantly that had children with autism saying, you know, we really need the police to know about uh, the disability that my child suffers with, because if they deal with my child, they might not react in the way of some, that somebody else would. And, and parents saying, I, I wish there was a way for me to tell the department so that if they come to my address or they interact with my son or daughter, uh, there might be some way that they could know ahead of time uh, that, that they might react differently. And so, um, Madison Police Department, for example, created the first voluntary registry system, meaning people can call in and offer up this information so that the department can be more informed and have it in their records so that if the address gets pulled up, they'll know that there's potentially somebody there uh, based on the information provided to the, uh, to the department. 
expanding the use of the 911 system, expanding the post curriculum about dealing with the needs of the disability community, uh, and developing uh, a study on the impact of SROs. Really, this is kind of controversial. We didn't come up with a recommendation. We just, as school resource officers, we really need to consider the role they're currently playing um, and evaluate the degree to which that might be appropriate. And the state this year did pass a mandate that um, a variety of universities provide a study on this by January so they can decide future policy. Uh, funding police, uh, uh, by, we talked about how municipalities can find money for some of the things we were recommending, implementing the state, the 98 crisis hotline, which the state is doing. Uh, we had recommended, this is a moot point at this point, that uh, candidates for uh, inspector general should be able to be hired from outside the division of criminal justice. The legislature did make that change. Um, what do we do if police departments don't um, report officers who need to be decertified? There's certain standards that say if an officer does X, they should be decertified, but it all requires the police chief or police administrator in that town to trigger that uh, call to the post council. So we made some recommendations to the legislature and they did pass them this year that said, you need to improve, right? If, if a police chief doesn't report an officer who meets the standard for decertification, there should be penalties. Um, and they did make that improvement this year. And they should also be built into the, the um, accreditation standards. So if you're not reporting who's supposed to be reported, you should lose your accreditation status as a police agency. And that was also done this year. Mandating the state accreditation program instead of the CLIA program. We talked about that, that got done this year. Uh, creating a civilian complaint system. There needs to be a system for gathering civilian complaints statewide. Currently, the only complaint that's mandated to be captured statewide is complaints of racial profiling, uh, but not in other categories. So the recommendation was to expand a citizen complaint program. We uh, made very detailed recommendations to municipalities who wanted to create a civilian review board. The different types of civilian review boards that exist, the different ways to implement them, the different ways to think about setting them up. Um, so it was just guidance for municipalities. If you're considering this, here are the things you need to consider when putting that together. Um, believe it or not, a lot of officers in right, a lot of particularly smaller departments, uh, officers that get assigned to IA, internal affairs, they don't necessarily have to go through any training. There's no mandate that before you are part of IA, you have to potentially conduct these investigations that you go through some base level training. And so we recommended that, you know, that's just, that's should be right there should be some standard training that all individuals assigned to ia go through to ensure that uh, they meet the appropriate standards a uh, very detailed proposal on reforming some of our traffic laws taking some of those low level motor vehicle offenses um, and uh, making them secondary so telling police you, know, you can't stop somebody for you know, a low level lighting violation uh, you can you can deal with that if you stop them for speeding uh, that proposal was somewhat controversial uh, this session. Uh, it didn't pass, uh, and I have a feeling it'll be up for much debate in the future. Um, creating police census data. We don't actually have a good idea of the general makeup of law enforcement in Connecticut. We know how many officers there are, but we don't know general census information, years of service age, uh, demographic information. And so mandating that police departments uh, provide that information annually, either on their website or as part of of the accreditation process. Uh, public availability of police policies. A lot of times police policies are very hard to find. You go on a police department's website and you don't know what their use of force policy was. Departments have been getting better over the years and provided some of that. Uh, but again, we made a recommendation that certain police policies need to be mandated to be on every police department's website uh, in the name of transparency. Uh, we're coming to the end here. Civilian interview panels, finding ways when hiring police officers to integrate civilians into the hiring process, bringing civilians in to be a part of the interview process early on, uh, and the different ways that you can go about uh, having civilian interview panels. And then the last set of recommendations, uh, police peer intervention, duty to intervene training. So ensuring that uh, police departments, police administrators have the appropriate training uh, for police chief command staff on their duty to change the policy, to change the culture, to ensure that uh, the police officers intervene when necessary. So mandating uh, that the post council create a, a thorough um, training program. 
So the full report of the task force is on the state website, uh, ctpolicetransparency.com, along with a summary of the police accountability bill that I provided to you. Uh, I went over time, uh, so thank you. I'll take questions, but I will take them uh, after uh, the Inspector General speaks. I think I'm turning it over, I'll turn it over to Michael, and then they'll introduce Judge Depp. Uh, certainly, thank you. Um, and we will have the questions. Um, Judge, if you could come up. Uh, Ken, I, I um, am impressed again with uh, the information that you provided us with. Uh, and I'm also impressed that you didn't listen when I asked you the 20 minutes and you, you were like a Baptist minister. You keep time the way we do, which is uh, to keep talking. So we do appreciate that. Well, um, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, good to see my uh, colleague, uh, Judge Mary Summer here, um, and uh, Chief Shaw. So my name is Robert Devlin, um, and the, I've been the Inspector General for the State of Connecticut since October of last year. Um, and before that, I spent about 27 years as a judge in our state. Uh, for most of that, as a Superior Court judge, uh, mostly hearing civil uh, criminal cases, rather, criminal cases, and then the last couple of years working in our Connecticut Appellate Court. Um, and I, after I retired as a judge, uh, this opportunity came forward, and uh, so I was selected to be Connecticut's first Inspector General. I'm very pleased that um, several members of my staff are here today. Uh, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, they're all inspectors. The Inspector General's office has myself and one other attorney, and then we have um, seven inspectors. These are investigators that, that work on our cases. They're all former police officers uh, with uh, distinguished careers in law enforcement. Uh, Bill Bavar and Mark Sinise both worked for the Stanford Police Department before they joined our unit. Uh, Frank Capozzi was a captain with the Waterbury Police Department. Uh, they've been on board since uh, early uh, 2022 and are uh, doing a great job for us. So um, I'm just going to use this whiteboard and just put up a couple of words here, which I think may be useful in terms of trying to focus our, our discussion here. Um, So our basic jurisdiction by the statute is to investigate instances where police officers use deadly force. Usually that's discharging their firearm, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. Um, use of a um, chokehold uh, is now under Connecticut law a use of deadly force. Um, and that can be, it's not limited to use of a firearm, but almost always that's what it is. It doesn't make any difference if someone gets hit. It's not about injury, it's about the use of deadly force. So you can have most serious cases, obviously, where a police officer uses deadly force and um, it's fatality. Um, but if someone uses deadly force and wounds someone, or uses deadly force and misses, our point of view is still within our jurisdiction to investigate that and to determine you know, whether or not that use of deadly force was justified. You know, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, the other thing are in custody deaths. Uh, people who are in the custody of either the Department of Correction or a police office, police department. Um, so, in Connecticut, it's rare for someone to die in the custody of a police agency. It almost never happens. We have one case that we're investigating now where a gentleman died um, in the custody of the Norwich Police Department, and we're, uh, we're looking into that. Um, but personally, I've been surprised as the number of people who die in the custody of the Department of Correction. I mean, we're keeping track of that. We've got almost 60 people so far this year who have died in the custody of the Department of Correction. Um, now, some of them, very straightforward. 
Uh, these are people who have serious illnesses, like cancer, uh, or maybe COVID, or, or some other serious illness, and they die of natural causes while they're serving a sentence. But others, you know, people die of suicides, uh, people die of drug overdoses, uh, and so we look into that. How do people get drugs? Uh, what are the protocols to sort of protect people who may have some, you know, tendencies for self-harm or, or, or uh, suicidal ideation? How do you sort of maybe address that? Um, so we're looking at those things. Uh, we are investigating that. We have now, uh, we're keeping a, a database on that. It, it may be an opportunity for us as, as the Inspector General's office uh, to make some recommendations based on this data that we're collecting in terms of, um, you know, what, what does it look like in Connecticut in terms of in-custody deaths? Why are people dying in, in custody? What do we know about the, these situations? With respect to the use of deadly force, uh, the overarching obligation of, of my office is determine whether or not that use of deadly force was justified. And um, the standard that ex exists now and has existed is whether or not that use of force was reasonable. You know, under all the circumstances, was what the police officer did reasonable? Um, it's very important in these cases to avoid the temptation for um, 2020 hindsight, Monday morning quarterbacking, things like that. Oftentimes, you know, as you learn about an a, a situation or, or an incident, you know, you learn more about it in terms of what happened after the police officer used force. Um, but it's um, important to try to focus the attention in the immediate incident, you know, the immediately what happened. Uh, uh, police officers have to make uh, split second decisions under dangerous circumstances, uh, and all that the law figures into this whole notion of, of reasonableness. But what this Police Accountability Act did, in terms of deciding whether or not some action is reasonable, it added a couple of sort of considerations that have to be considered. So in deciding whether or not what a police officer did in using deadly force was reasonable, one thing you should consider is whether or not de-escalation techniques were utilized. Well, first off, were they feasible uh, under the circumstances? And sometimes these fast moving situations, they're not. Uh, but if they are feasible, uh, were they utilized reasonably? So for example, if you have a situation where you're, you're person's controlled, uh, they're not a danger to the public, they're not a danger to other police officers, you know, maybe sort of moving in to immediately arrest them might not be the best move. It may be appropriate to actually slow the process down, uh, take what's called sort of a, a tactical pause, and sort of come up with a plan that may involve bringing in people who have that crisis intervention training, who may have some ability to communicate with people, to maybe learn something about the person, their name, their family, their sort of situation, and maybe use that information to create lines of communication that can, you know, have everybody go home uh, and nobody gets hurt, which is the ultimate obligation here. Um, the objective here, though. So de-escalation techniques are one part. And the other thing that the law adds uh, new is this whole notion of officer-created jeopardy. That is, uh, in determining whether or not the police use of deadly force was reasonable, uh, among the factors you are to consider is whether the police techniques made matters worse, uh, in the sense of creating an almost inevitable situation where deadly force is being used. Now, police officers, again, this is all cited within the context of these uh, of these uh, incidents, uh, you know, it can be night, it can be bad weather, it can be bad lines of sight. Uh, people may have weapons, uh, so these are fast moving, dangerous situations, and all that counts in terms of evaluating this overall question of reasonableness. But it's also true that you know sometimes the techniques that the police officers use create jeopardy. It is a notion of officer created jeopardy is something that you know by law we're required to look at to determine whether or not these incidents are justifiable, reasonable, or not. Um, so I inherited about a dozen cases from when I became Inspector General. Uh, I've issued four reports, uh, and where we've had three new cases uh, come in, and you know, it's sort of a dynamic process where we, we, all, we sort of write reports and complete cases, and new cases come in. Um, it's been extremely interesting. Uh, um,
there are things that I've learned through this that I didn't expect to learn. But one is this whole idea of um, suicide by cop, um, which is actually quite prevalent. Um, you know, people actually get themselves in a situation where they, they provoke the police to shoot them. You know, they're, they're in a very sort of um, um, fragile situation mentally, and they create these situations where they're, they're doing things with the intent of provoking police officers to use deadly force against them. It's almost a third of the cases uh, across the country involve this an aspect of this, of this suicide by cop notion, and we've had it in Connecticut. Um, and so there's a lot of actual research, research done on that in terms of what sorts of things may be useful. Um, the FBI has written a couple of papers on that, which are actually quite good. And uh, I think um, part of my job is going to be to collect this data and maybe make some recommendations uh, as to some of the things we might be able to do in Connecticut to address the situation. Uh, again, it, it, it's, it's hard. Uh, we, these situations oftentimes is not evident that it's a suicide by cop situation until after the fact. Uh, so uh, you have to make sure officer safety, public safety is paramount in these situations. But that said, you know, there may be a space uh, to sort of look at some different techniques in some of these cases. Um, so we're, we're uh, a new agency. I mean, we're just part of my work has been to stand up our office to, to uh, hire people that work for us. Uh, but we are, I think, um, hopefully going to make a positive uh, contribution uh, to uh, the investigation of these, in, of these incidents, which are you know, highly controversial. I mean, it, it's the, my work stands right in the crosshairs between these sort of uh, different um, threads in our society. Uh, these cases create a lot of interest. Uh, they create a lot, I think, sometimes they're seen as almost metaphors for larger you know, issues in our society. Um, and I understand that, but my job is look at these individual cases, at these individual events, and decide, look, is this a justified use of deadly force or not? And then write a report, and then, or if appropriate, write an arrest warrant, uh, and, and the matter proceeds uh, from that point. So um, that's all I have for prepared remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure Ken's happy to answer any questions on his excellent presentation. Uh, but. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. I'd be happy to try and do my best to answer them. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, okay. I guess uh, one of the questions that there might be for both of you, gentlemen, you talked about the duty now for officers to intervene in a situation where they might see an excessive use of force. Do we have any data on when that became? The law, how many reports there have uh, that have occurred today? So that became effective, I think, July one of twenty twenty. Might have been October, but yeah. Okay, October. Okay, um, I received zero reports of that. Zero, and we have no data from municipalities of how many times that may have been reported within individual departments yet. So, do you know when that data will be available? I'm just trying to see. Because in order to me, in order for the rule or the law to be effective, you got to be able to see if there's any reports and then follow on of what happened after the report. You know, the state did not um, mandate that individual departments report the number of times that, say, an officer reported to a supervisor that they think maybe somebody used excessive force or that an officer intervened. So at this point, there's a duty that officers intervene, but the only sort of uh, mechanism for, for managing that is if it turns out, right now, everybody eventually will have body cameras, use of force information, uh, incidents in particular are uh, uh, investigated by each individual department. And so I think you're really not gonna hear about that at this point until, right, likely a department is investigating a use of force incident and then saying, well, hang on a minute, there was an opportunity to intervene, why didn't you? So, but there's no sort of system in place where every time uh, something is reported internally uh, that that gets reported to the state. So it's not really a data point uh, that we'll have uh, at this point. And, and just to follow up with that, um, we have some questions that came in previously, um, but who is the overarching 
agency that receives any of this, um, any of the reports? Is is there one? So my reports? Well, no, no, no. Just like the um, uh, any of the the, the mandated uh, things that the uh, the bill does. That, that the bill does. Yeah. Yes. Is so there a we, task force? Yes. Yeah, so I, that question's come up a couple times, right? Um, the bill itself, right, as I said in the beginning, is really many bills impacting many laws. And so different provisions of the law require different reporting requirements to different entities within government, right? So obviously, um, um, for example, um, use of force reporting goes to the Office of Policy and Management, which is overseen by the governor's office, and we collect those on their behalf, right? Um, Complaints to, to law enforcement are investigated separately. Certain reports, say on police pursuits, which is a mandated reporting, goes to the Police Officer Standards and Training Council. The Inspector General has their reporting requirements back to either the legislature or the commission uh, or the state in general. So there's no sort of one entity in the state that everything is funneled to. We're still, right, it's a still fairly broken up system based on the authority of each independent entity. What is the process for making the results of the Inspector General's work available to the public? Sure. So um, I'm required to file a I'm required to file a report um, with the Chief State's Attorney. Uh, and the Chief State's Attorney then uh, mails a copy of that report to the um, uh, head of the municipality where it happened, the mayor or first election, whatever, um, and then to the Judiciary Committee. Um, and then we post it as a public document on the Division of Criminal Justice website. So on the DCJ website, there's a section for the Inspector General. Uh, and when you click on that, you'll see every report that's been filed uh, probably for the last you know, 10 or 15 years. 21 uh, years. 21 years. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a great, we've had so three iterations of how to do these things. Initially, the state's attorney where the incident happened would be charged with leading the invest investigation to see whether or not the use of force was justified. And then it moved, as, as Ken said, to a state's attorney from another district, not the district where it happened due to that same thing. And that's been sort of uh, superseded by the inspector general. So these reports, though, are all there. And, and so they're easily accessible and the public can read them. They're very detailed. There's lots of information. The other thing, too, is that um, the standard for investigating incidents has changed over time. It used to be that the state would only investigate if death occurred. But years ago, they changed the standard, and now it's the standard that the Inspector General spoke of, um, where they're investigating not just if death resulted from the use of force, but they're now also investigating right, a variety of deadly force incidents. So you know, the thing you have to keep in mind when you look at that data, you might see over time, the number of incidents the state is investigating is increasing. That doesn't mean that there's more incidents occurring. It's because we actually changed the standard of when an investigation occurs uh, over those 20 plus years. And with the technology we have now, you know, we can embed in these reports links to the body worn cameras or the motor vehicle cameras. So the reader can actually see this sort of evidence and make their own assessment as to, as to what they feel is, is the correct result or not. Listen, following up on Josiah's question, if you have to file a report on use of force, officer in the ravine on use of force. Why isn't there a report in the use of force about the officer in the ravine? Uh, there's a gap there that doesn't seem to make sense. Like for instance, if, if I'm an officer and I see another officer using force illegally, you know, I'm required to intervene on him. And then I have to report that use of force by the officer that I intervene on, then that should be in the report. There's very likely going to be a paper trail, particularly the situation you outline is likely going to trigger an in internal affairs investigation and they are likely going to have a very detailed report on the need to intervene whether it was appropriate whether some sort of action should be taken against the officer that should be intervened against um, departments all have policies dictating how these in incidents are investigated the gap is reporting that information to the state right so i don't want people to think that these aren't investigated by departments um, when appropriate, but right now the state, uh, why I don't know, right? It just wasn't I mean, a consideration like a they made. It's a wall issue. I mean, for instance, on the form for reporting, the use of force should be 
was an officer required to be. Thank you. When you're working in an organization and you report on a colleague, it could be very difficult for the person who makes that report to really understand how institutions operate. Um, what protections are there for that person who <coughs> reports excessive force, particularly if his colleagues turn on him, if he's ignored, if he feels that he has to leave his job or she slumped? So the, the law actually provides additional protections, the Police Accountability Bill did, for officers that report other officers for, uh, say, excessive force, right? There's a retaliation laws that uh, prevent. Now, that does, right? We've had laws, say, on retaliation in the workplace for a long time here in Connecticut. It doesn't mean that people still aren't uncomfortable reporting, right? Because what that gets to, what you're talking about is really cultures within organizations and police departments have their own cultures as well. So one of the recommend, we actually had a very long conversation as a police task force over 18 months of what do we do, right? How do we ensure that police administrators are creating a culture where uh, officers feel comfortable in being able to uh, report something that they've seen is wrong uh, and have that addressed, particularly before things get to a point where potentially somebody is harmed or even killed. And so. Uh, I think was one of our last recommendations of the task force is both to the legislature and the post council saying you really need to be creating uh, and mandating thoughtful programming and training for police administrators about how to create that type of a culture. Right, and I think that's probably where we need to start from it's police leaders creating a culture where um, uh, which then trickles down to other supervisors creating an environment where uh, those open lines of communication occur. So yeah, there's legal protections, right? They can't retaliate against you for, right? Um, but that doesn't always mean that the culture um, um, allows people to feel safe and confident that if they report something, there won't be um, um, something that comes back on them. And so our recommendation initially was, let's focus on helping police administrators create that culture. And it will take, all, it will take time. We just have to be honest about that. The way the law is right now, I mean, it's a lot more strict than Carol. Because if you see an excessive use of force and you do not intervene, it's on you. You're an accessory to that crime. You can get arrested. You, you can get, you, your failure to intervene has serious legal consequences. So it's not like people just sit back and say, oh boy, I'm, I'm afraid they're not going to like me in the police department if I, if I do this. You're putting yourself in legal jeopardy uh, if you let that slide. I think that's, I mean, so with much more, uh, maybe a, a negative consequences trying to drive this as opposed to, you know, encouraging people in, in that regard. Um, a question that we have concerns civilian review boards. I noticed on your slide, it said that the law <laughs> allows, not mandates, but allows for civilian review boards. Um, can you give some examples of what a civilian review board would do? There's lots of different models for civilian review boards. The state did not mandate civilian review boards because in a large number of communities across Connecticut, there is civilian oversight to some degree. So in Stanford, I believe you have a police commission, right? Which, you know, some could argue effectively serves in the capacity of civilian oversight of the police agency. Believe it or not, police commissions exist in the vast majority of municipal police departments here in Connecticut. A lot of municipalities when contemplating this law didn't wanna leave that model, right? They liked the police commission model, it worked for them. And so the legislature didn't wanna mandate civilian review boards um, because they wanted municipalities to be able to uh, react to the, the needs of their individual community. So the police commission is certainly one model and police commissions vary in terms of power and authority. Some have the power and authority to hire and fire police officers and police administrators. Some have the authority to help set policy uh, for departments. Um, and then you have civilian review boards. You find um, there's also different models for civilian review boards. So the best model that I've personally seen in this area is Westport. Uh, so if you're looking for a model to just look at and have conversations about, uh, that's what we call a hybrid model. Um, some civilian review boards have investigative power. So Hartford, for example, as a civilian review board, Hartford has its own inspector general that can investigate certain civilian complaints. 
and the Hartford uh, Civilian Review Board has subpoena power and the power to investigate uh, complaints of wrongdoing within the department. Then you have models um, like Westport or even West Hartford, where I'm from, where uh, they're more advisory capacity. They have the ability, they're required to meet so many times a year. They provide uh, advice to the police chief about the potential hiring and firing of officers. Cases are presented to them. Ultimately, the, um, uh, the ability to say dismiss an officer is with the police administrator. It's not with the civilian review board. Typically, civilian review boards in that fashion don't go out and do their own investigative work. They rely on the police department to do their internal affairs investigative report, and they serve more as a review, right? The, the uh, IA reports are coming to the civilian review board. They're reviewing them, and then they're making recommendations back to the police administrator. And like I said, Westport has a bit of a hybrid model. Most civilian review boards, the reality is, don't have the financial resources or the ability you know, to uh, take on the investigative model. It requires potentially staff um, or the ability to go out and do investigations. And so most models um, that we've seen develop since the passage of this bill are, you know, some have more authority to uh, mandate, say, the dismissal, but most are serving in an advisory capacity to the police administrator or the town council. Uh, but it's a way to integrate civilians into the process. So there is no mandate. Uh, it's certainly encouraged. And if you look at the report that we produced, we outline sort of the different models that could be considered. And we outline the different authority and the different things, components that would need to go into developing an investigative model versus an advisory model versus some hybrid model. Um, uh, and, and again, we try and also outline the role that we've seen police commissions play uh, here in the state of Connecticut. Questions? I will be. Excuse me for saying. Well, well, hold on, because we're we're recording, oh. so we want. Oh, yes, excuse me for saying so, but it sounds like uh, just a ton of bureaucracy here. More reports, boards, committees, reviews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This gentleman here, I heard a little while ago, saying that they were investigating how drugs are getting into jails. If I'm not mistaken, uh, that's about the extent of what I have to say for right now. I mean, uh, well, we shouldn't investigate how drugs get into jails. Not that it's a new problem. Well, it's new drugs because the drugs are fentanyl. And these guys go into jail and they spend six months, eight months in jail. And they might have used drugs outside on the street, fine. But they get in jail and their systems can't contemplate it. And they take this stuff, which is hundred times more powerful than morphine and it kills them. And so if staff or guards or, or cleaning people, if they're a conduit for that stuff to get into jails, it's killing people. And I think that's a worthwhile thing to look at. Mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. My point was that, again, you know, uh, getting back to the uh, uh, gift of the seminar here is that it seems like a lot of a lot more bureaucracies and, and boards looking into things, paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. I tell you the truth, I think that's one reason why my office was created, because we're just a standalone office. We're not connected with the prosecutors. We're not connected with uh, these sort of overarching uh, groups. Our job is to look at these use of deadly force <laughs> incidents and investigate them and get to the truth. So it's a very focused, actually, mission that we have. Um, and we don't have a lot of cases, but they're all quite important. Uh, so. We really do focus on that. I think that was wise of the legislature to give us a narrow focus and the resources to uh, uh, act on that. But that's, um, so it's not, all, I mean, it may look like that a little bit, but it's not, I don't think it's 100% like that. And I think regarding the things that I covered, yeah, I think that's a, you've provided a fair assessment, right? It is a lot of bureaucracy, but the reality is that uh, a lot of parts of government touch on policing, right? Uh, municipalities touch on policing, um, the state plays a role in uh, policing, and over time, these bureaucracies, um, they've grown. Uh, is it the most efficient system? I don't know, right? I mean, that's another question to probably contemplate, but I don't think your assessment is wrong, right? We've got, you've got a post council, and then you've got a municipality, you've got a commission, you've got a board. You know, it's, it's true. Um, I'm actually, typically, I tend to be comforted by that uh, because it means that it's less likely uh, that 
you know, entities are going to get away with doing the wrong thing. There's just too many hands um, um, in the cookie jar for, you know, some big conspiracy to happen or for some police department, for example, to pull the wool over our eyes on something. There's just too much, right? There's too many different entities and different groups uh, that play a role in modern policing. So for me, that's comforting, but your, but your assessment isn't wrong in that it is, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of what the bill did was it tweaked the way those bureaucracies uh, interact with police here in Connecticut. I think that's fair. I just want to make a comment about the police uh, civilian review rules. Uh, you know, here in Stanford, do we have one? No. Okay, well, yeah, I served, I guess, two terms as uh, on the police commission here in Stanford in the 1980s when I chaired the commission. And I know that we received complaints about individual police from the chief and they investigated themselves. Now, for the normal run of a mill complaint uh, for someone you know, who is illegal under justice, something like that, that works fine. Uh, but there are certain sensitive political things that come up. And I think there might be a mandate to have someone outside of the police department investigating the police, as opposed to the commission, which is appointed by the mayor, receiving you know, complaints Report that is totally generated within the police department itself. Uh, there might be a need for some outside involvement, and I just wanted to put that out there to be considered. Yeah, and I think the best model for that here in Connecticut is what Hartford's done recently, right? They they tried to almost model what the state did and bring in their own inspector general. Now, their inspector general isn't investigating, for example, right, deadly use of force incidents. That's still left to the state, but it's an independent individual with an independent office office and an independent budget, and they have the ability and authority to uh, investigate complaints and make uh, recommendations that are uh, limited from influence from um, um, from some of the factors that you talk about. But we don't see that very, that's not a very common model here in Connecticut. Um, I actually, I do have a question, but before I ask that question, um, just in response to some of the really thoughtful comments. Um, for people um, in the audience, I think one of the things that has been raised is whether it's bureaucracy or one person's bureaucracy can be another person's process, which is a good thing. Um, but also uh, looking forward to, and I guess this is for um, a bit of a plug for the organization, and this um, that we that in upcoming sessions in the next two weeks and beyond, we're actually going to hear from our local law enforcement and both here at Stanford and surrounding communities. And I think just today was laying that foundation, which um, we all learn so, so very much about that, that process and the issues that really concern us. With respect to the uh, Civilian Review Board, the, um, you know, that's, as, as I know, I think we were both serving or in overlap with each other back in the day. Um, but in, in the Stanford Stands Against Racism has had many discussions um, well, with law enforcement and with those involved in the community, that's as you say, it can be the statute authorizes the establishment of a civilian review board by ordinance. There's a process, and there are aspects of the process that are important for us to understand here in this community is that that is governed by our charter. So that's, and because it's a legislative process, that would anticipate very broad, robust, and hopefully informed discussion to meet the particular needs of the community. Stanford Stamps Against Racism did a program several months back, um, bringing in um, a professional from another area, to, basically as part of a learning process. So again, just like today, it's all part of a learning process. You might not have time now that I finally got to my question, which is, um, and I understand, but going, backing up um, to the earlier part of the a uh, statute that provides for pre-docket prosecutorial review. Um, I, can you just give us maybe even a brief summary of, of what's been happening with that statewide, or is it too early? So I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm, it's actually not something that I have followed all that closely. I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Uh, I, I'm actually, I haven't even, I'm not even sure what the chief state's attorney and the chief court administrator may have put in place or if that's been implemented yet. They were mandated to, but if I answered, I would be making it up. So, in some, in some districts, they have um, early intervention prosecutors. In many states, there's this gap between the police arrest and start of the court process. Um, and Connecticut is not like that. 
police officers make an arrest, they bring the paperwork to the court, and it goes in front of the docket to be in front of the judge that morning. Um, this is trying to capture this ability to sort of look at these cases, particularly misdemeanor cases, between the point of arrest and the point of the court process. I think in some of our larger jurisdictions, we do have these early intervention prosecutors whose job it is to do just that. It's not statewide, I think that's the plan, but it is being implemented uh, in sort of a pilot type way. And only one question for me, or several speeches, but now let's choose a lot of speeches. I really like what the general back there was saying about having a private group here in Stanford. Because to me, because of all the bureaucracy that we do, we have to go through, it would make it simpler if we had a group here that could give information that wouldn't take so long to do some of the processes that we have to go through to get things accomplished. It should make it a little bit easier, but that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will just say, you know, in terms of sort of bureaucracy and process, um, I work with 100 plus police departments on a variety of different programs throughout the state. Larger police agencies are sometimes challenging because of just all they have to deal with, right? There are hundreds of officers and uh, they're dealing with a variety of, of challenges in their communities and, um, and that can be a struggle. Stanford is one of the uh, largest communities here in Connecticut, uh, but it's also one of the few communities that if I pick up the phone and call the police chief, I can usually get a hold of them right away. So, which is different, right? If I do that in, not to, I'm not slamming Bridgeport, Hartford or New Haven, because again, there's just different challenges there, but. You know, um, you know, my experience with Stanford has been that they've been fairly responsive uh, to the needs of the state, uh, which can sometimes be a challenge for large agencies. So I think that benefits your community. So the state one, there are a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. To get some help from the local to help the state. Oh, I would agree. Okay, that's my point. Yeah, Mike, just one quick comment. Um, Judge Somers, I agree 100%. It's very difficult for me to uh, sit back and not, I want to be in session two. But I want to tell you what Stanford's doing. Ken mentioned, I don't think Ken will be here next week or on July 9th, but I want Ken to use Stanford as an example. I don't want to hear about Willamette. Uh, we're doing it. We have a social worker already embedded. Uh, he's not aware of that, but we'll have a discussion afterwards. So there are things based on accountability, bill, based on prior to the murder of George, George Floyd, we had already things that were already set in motion. Uh, accreditation, we already started it before we were mandated to do it. So I'll wait for session two. They will be here, and I'm glad I was here to find out what the community is looking for. We'll have the right people in a room. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I'll be on vacation with the family. However, uh, what you're saying, every time Ken mentioned a little romantic, I wanted to jump up and down, but uh, I held my tongue because I'm going to wait for session two. So there are some things to stay with you, just so everyone knows. Okay, I know time is getting short, right. so we're going to take one, one more, more question. we have session two, as the teacher said. So I'll make my short uh, <laughs> since we are um, close to time here. But those are a lot of provisions in the police accountability bill, and it's kind of piggyback on what Josiah said. Is there some agency or someone who's going to measure all of these changes to see, you know, maybe the next year or two, how we turned out and have a report back to the community and say, we made all these changes and this is what has happened. Good question. Uh, the legislature uh, did not contemplate that, right, when they passed all of these provisions. Again, the different entities that are responsible for implementing the different provisions of the law do have some requirements to 
report back on the progress they're making, but there isn't necessarily one centralized entity. I will tell you that we did receive uh, some private dollars from the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving to um, continue our work in helping assist the state uh, in uh, uh, understanding uh, what is happening. And so we're actually in the process of, of developing an implementation guide that can go out to police departments, sort of like the President Obama's 21st Century Task Force on Policing has created a very detailed implementation guide for departments how do you implement all the things that the legislature is asking of you? Uh, and then I think our next uh, move as a, as a policy institute will be to measure all of the different provisions and to see how well we've done in implementing them. You really got to give it time. I mean, yeah, we're two years in from the bill being passed. Many provisions of the bill didn't, they didn't just, they didn't take effect right away. They took effect over the course of two years. For example, the use of force data collection provision goes into effect this July, right? So there's still things being rolled out and implemented. And so I think we really should have a better handle on um, the scope of the reforms and how they have impacted the state of Connecticut and policing in Connecticut realistically in two to three more years. And, and our institute is committed to doing that. We're uh, funded by the legislature to do work just like that. And so that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you so much. Can we give our speakers a hand? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This first session has been wonderful. Um, I'm Yolan Ford from Cradle to Career, the Director of Equity Initiatives, and I really appreciate each of you for being here, and we look forward to uh, July 9th. You've heard a couple of people um, uh, talk about it, so we invite you to come back. We're going to have a wonderful conversation with um, our own Stanford Police Department as well as neighboring uh, police departments. So we really want you to come back so that we can have a um, a conversation, not just asking questions like we're doing now, but really have a conversation about this. Um, they've laid the foundation of what this law has um, or is doing for us, and so we really want to have a real good conversation about it. We definitely want to thank all of our partners who have allowed us to put this on. We want to thank uh, Stanford Stands Against Racism. We also want to thank um, Stanford Cradle to Career. Uh, Community Health Center, the Y of Stanford, um, they have all been 100 black men of Stanford. And so we really want to thank all of them for allowing us to be able to put these three sessions on for the community. Um, Michael, do you have anything else? I, I think you've said it all. We just want to thank all of you for participating today. Uh, this is an educational opportunity for us. We didn't come with any preset answers. But we came with the idea that we wanted to learn. And so in that, in doing the research, I think that that's important. Then we can begin the conversations about what should it look like and envisioning the future uh, and, and understanding the present as to what we have right now. Uh, so again, thank you very much. And we'll be looking forward to seeing some of you uh, in two weeks.